Well, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak at, the, at this meeting. I'm particularly delighted to share the platform with Ismahan and, 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 and Joachim. Um, this is what I've been asked to speak about, um, the report of the high-level EU Committee on Food System Science. The only problem is this report is not available yet. So I'm going to give you a little foretaste of it at, towards the end of the presentation. But what I want to do is really take a long view. I want to talk about um, what has happened at, over the last 70 years. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail in this, in this but I think it's important uh, to, to give this perspective. But then look to the future, to the next 30 years. And very much this aligns with what Joachim has just been talking about. And then at the end, uh, talk about where does the expert group report, where does this fit into this broader picture of what is to happen for the future. So just some of the, the big things that have happened here over this past 70 years. I mean, as Joachim said, the FAO was established following the food, uh, f the food summit in 1943. But even more significantly, the FAO was one of the four pillar institutions that was established to, to, to bring about post-war recovery for the world. So from, from that point of view, the, FAO, the FAO's importance then and its continuing importance just needs to be, to be mentioned. The, the crisis in the 60s, when many countries in the world were facing famine and, and really serious food shortages, was actually tackled by dealing with by, by the Green Revolution. Uh, this extraordinary achievement of science and technology, uh, which happened probably from the late 1960s onwards. The person who was most associated with this was Norman Borlaug, who re received the Nobel Prize in 1970 for his work. We move on into the 80s, and countries are, generally speaking, protectionist, country, uh, protectionist policies for farming in the, the major uh, indu industrial countries, and they, with, with lots of barriers, etc., in place. And then tackling this was the job of, of what was then called the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, one of the other pillar institutions for the post-war agenda. And I want to mention some names as we go through this litany. And it, one name is the late Peter Sutherland, who, was, who brought those negotiations to a conclusion and was the Director General of the World Trade Organization on its establishment in 1995. 2007, 2008, we had the, the food price crisis. That's against the background of, I would say, three decades of taking food for granted. And suddenly, uh, 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 for a whole set of supply and demand factors, prices rise. Food becomes politically important again because of riots, food riots in over 30 countries. So food is back on the agenda again. But then we, get, we move to these two landmark decisions in, 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 in 26, or two agreements in, in 2015, the SDGs and the Climate Paris Agreement. But in the subsequent years, not enough progress being made to realize the, what was decided at these uh, meetings. And that is actually the background to the UN Secretary General calling the Food System Summit in 2019 for to be eventually held in 2021 on the clear proposition that if the SDGs are to be attained, it has to be on the basis of sustainable food systems, as, as Joachim says. Let's look at the European story. Early 1950s, <coughs> huge issue, food, a central political issue, uh, addressed in with the treaty, beginning with political integration, economic integration from with the Treaty of Rome and the establishment of the European Economic Community, uh, and with agriculture as its primary policy. Uh, the Common Agricultural Policy set up in 1958, and its father, literally Siko Manschuld, who was, had been Minister for Agriculture in Netherlands for 
13 years before that, and then he, kept, he remained commissioner for agriculture for, six, for, for, for a further 16 years. We come back to, into the business of, 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 of markets and, and in, the, in the 1980s, too, much, too, much, too many surplus products, uh, the milk quota introduced, and again, another important name to recognize, Ray McSharry. Uh, the Commissioner for Agriculture at the time, the first really major reform of the common agricultural policy. And that policy, that reform process has been continuing. But then we reach 2019, and this is really a landmark moment when the Commission and proposes the European Green Deal, that we have to take the environment more seriously. And with its, its two flanking policies directly linked to agriculture, farm to fork and biodiversity. So what about the Irish story? Well, here we're talking about the early, from the early 50s onwards, if in effect, subsistence agriculture. And there's just two statistics which I want to, to, to use to illustrate this. There was a study in 1949 by an Australian expert who concluded that he had seen hundreds of Irish fields which are growing as little as is physically possible for the land to grow under an Irish sky. That was a fairly, fairly telling uh, statement. But another statistic, the animal health st sta standards at the time, 1951 study, 30% of the cattle and 44% of the cows tested positive for tuberculosis. That was our starting point in the immediate post-war period. At a crucial moment, the establishment of Unforest Tuluntish, the Agricultural Institute, 1958, done with the help of the Marshall Plan. Uh, another crucial moment, our entry to EEC, EEC in, and access to CAP in 1973. We share the, the, milk, the milk quota story as well. And then we're up to, in the early, from 2000 onwards, the first of the stakeholder-led five-year agri-food strategies. Uh, we note the, notion, the enlargement of, to EU28. We note the 2015 abolition of the milk quota, and we note Brexit. So they are all the, um, they are all, that's the combined story, international, Europe, and Ireland. This is another part of this, uh, that same story. What has happened to real agricultural prices over this period? Apart from a few spikes along the way, real agricultural prices have fallen consistently over a 60-year period. That, uh, there's another spike now. Where this is a, an OECD graph. But in fact, of course, the period from 2020 on, this was, report, this was a graph produced around 2020. Now, that another spike upwards due to Ukraine. But these are, these are the summary. This is my summary of what I think this means. If we look at that period from, 20, from 1950 to 20, 2020, we see this tri tripling of world population. But the number of hungry people remains more or less the same at 800 million. But as a proportion of the population, it has dramatically fallen. And the, under, the underlying reasons there are, of course, the economic growth and poverty reduction, particularly in Asia, crucial, and the green revolution in science. The downside, of course, is that this has, done, has been done with environmental damage to the, to the planet. And we, de we now have a new definition of what is malnutrition. We used to talk about malnutrition as being undernutrition. Now we know, in fact, it's more complex. It also involves micronutrient deficiencies with all the impact that has on health, and even more significantly, overweight and obesity. And that again adds up to why a food systems summit was called in, uh, and took place in 2021. Now, very briefly, uh, this is material that you're all, many, most of you are familiar with, the fact that we have had a series of 10-year strategies. Uh, the, the Food Vision 2030 is the fifth such strategy since, uh, 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 since 2000. And I do think, and Joachim has commented on, this is a, a very good strategy for this country. 
and it, we are setting out it, we're in a leadership role internationally with this strategy. But of course, we have to implement it. So what are the really distinguishing features of this strategy by comparison to some of the others? That's the definition for a sustainable food system. This is an FAO definition, and it was quoted already by the minister. But crucially, we, did, we have developed this strategy using a food systems approach, explicitly acknowledging the links between policies for agri-food, environment and climate, and nutrition and health. And that latter point has not been featured in any previous strategy. It is now there because it's relevant to today, and it's a in an area where I believe we need to, to make real progress, and that's, we're at an early stage in that agenda. But another critical thing in, in this strategy is that it's, it's stating that, uh, that there should be a coherence between our domestic policy on sustainable food systems and our foreign policy, our foreign and development cooperation policy. And that enables us to go to international conferences like the UN Food Systems Summit and say, we have this, our own vision, we're committed to its implementation, and we think it is relevant, indeed, to other, other countries. The, uh, the stra in, in practical terms, the, the strategy spelled out four key missions, and these are, 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 are those in, in, in the strategy. A climate-smart, uh, environmentally sustainable agri-food sector. That was given the prominence it was given, I would suggest, partly because of some of the inadequacies of the previous strategy. Foodwise 2025, which led to a very significant expansion in dairying, which was a, a, a economically desirable and objective thing, but did not take sufficient account of the environmental consequences of that expansion. The, the, and this mission two, viable and resilient primary production with enhanced well-being, I think that was a, re a response to the fact that some of the earlier strategies were, I think, very good in terms of spelling out and indeed delivering on ambitions for the food sector without giving adequate attention to what that meant for the primary producer. So this strategy was an attempt to, to get that balance a bit better. The third one on the whole area of food, which is safe, nutritious and appealing, trusted and valued at home and abroad, that's really building on, I think, some of the massive progress that's been made in this country over the last uh, 20 years, where we, we actually have a food offering which is increasingly attractive in terms of quality and value and obviously safety as, a, as an absolute underpinning. Uh, and then find this fourth mi uh, mission, which is really relevant to today's conference, and which the minister already spoke about, an innovative, competitive, and resilient agri-food sector driven by technology and talent. So if we look to the future, uh, and I suppose, the, the, I suppose the crucial point I want to make is that even though the, we've achieved great success over the past 70 years in increasing food production, uh, the, the nature of the challenge that we face over the next 30 years is a more complex one. It's not just about increasing food production, it's about increasing nutritious food production, which serves to deal with the agenda of health, and is also particularly linked to the climate uh, dimension. But what the Food System Summit has brought, has achieved, is that over 100 countries have committed to food systems transformation, uh, the Ukraine crisis has just brought the whole question of food and nutrition security up the political agenda, and it's, it's going to remain there for the foreseeable future. And then what we are faced with in the relatively short term, eight years, 2030, are we going to move towards serious achievement of what's spelled out in the SDGs and the Paris Agreement? When we look at the population trends between now and, uh, and, and 2050, we're talking about a further increase of about 2 billion people in the world. And then the big questions, uh, wh what's going to happen with our climate policy, with our uh, global warming? And then <clears throat> we talk about uncertainties and Donald Rumsfeld's famous phrase, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. The known unknowns are around geopolitics, climate impacts, and pandemics, as if, but as if they weren't enough. There may be others, 
which are the unknown unknown. So that's, that's, the, that's the context in which we are now moving into shape policy. But this, I think, are, this is what I would take to be some of the p p political and policy implications for the future, that the past decade, and it is really only in the past decade, that we've seen an increasing acceptance of the need to plan using a food systems approach. The commitments made at the UN Food System Summit have accelerated things in that direction, but they have to be delivered upon now with urgency and effective, effectiveness. But Ireland's tradition, I think, of using stakeholder-led development of agri-food strategy, and particularly the adoption of Food Vision 2030, provides a real opportunity for us to achieve international leadership in this field. What Joachim was attempting to, was, was saying at the end of uh, the, his presentation is needed. Um, briefly to talk about the, this high-level expert group which I've been chairing uh, for, the, for the European Commission. It was made up of 19 international experts. It, it worked from 20, last year 20, in February, and we've just completed our work uh, in the last week. Uh, it's, n it's, not, it's now going through a process of detailed preparation of the final report, which will be launched in Paris uh, in, on the 14th of June at the EU Standing Committee on Agricultural Research. This is what it's going to be, to, be, to be called. I mean, I can't go into the detail of it, but the critical thing is that it's, it, 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 what is it? It's a roadmap, I think, and signposts for this agenda of food systems transformation. It's really aimed at politicians and policymakers. And this agenda of food system transformation has to happen both at national level, at regional level, and at international level. I think this is a high quality report which is going to receive a good deal of attention from, I hope, the target audience for whom it's intended. This, a couple of graphics here just to give you a sense of what it's about, and I won't go into much detail here, but we were asked to look at what are the science policy interfaces that were need, are needed for to move uh, the world towards uh, food system transformation. And one important decision that we've, we took early on was that we should, we, the term science policy interfaces is not quite adequate for what we're talking about. We're actually talking about science policy society interfaces, an acknowledgement that if a change is to be achieved, we have to bring society along with us, consumers, citizens, etc. But these are the sorts of things that, that we're talking, we will be talking about in, in, the, in, in, the, in the document. This is another graphic which, which is looking at, if you like, and, and you could just read the top of, of this here. The food system must be understood from different perspectives. So if science policy, society interfaces provide the following functions, this should support action and policy leading to food systems transformation. So that's as much as I, I'm unveiling of this report today. You'll be able to read it all with great interest, I hope, uh, in about uh, two weeks' time. And these are my conclusions, that the sustainable food systems, they really represent a response to the twin imperatives of nourishing and expanding global population and meeting climate targets. Our Food Strategy 2030 aspires to be an international leader in, this, in, in these uh, uh, sustainable food systems. We need to recognize that the, uh, the, this concept of sustainability, which we, or is, is written down in our Food Vision document, it is attempting to deliver economic, environmental, and social sustainability. This is a difficult business. There's some really tough decisions and trade-offs to be made in this regard. But there is a critical role for the research and innovation community uh, if we are to move in this direction and achieve. So I would see today really as a, an early start to a discussion as to how, how this should be done and what resources are required to do it. Thank you for your attention.